states in their mission to educate our kids. So uh, sit back, buckle up. Let me give you some good news. Here's some good news too. I'm, I'm just naive enough to think that, that maybe I'm 17 weeks in as a congressman. I'm naive enough to think that maybe this is the topic that can bring our body together. Uh, we'll see, we'll see where that goes. I have already met with ranking member uh, Bonamici, who's sitting right to my right. In just a moment, I'm gonna introduce her for her, her opening remarks. But let me tell you where we've already agreed. We've spent time together and we've already agreed on this, that we're going to have a robust meeting uh, discussion. And uh, if I'm wrong or she's wrong, let's try to win each other over with the facts and debate as we go forward. So with that, it's gonna be a great day, a great meeting. I'm gonna introduce our panelists in just a moment, but first, let's go to Ranking Member Bonamici for her opening thoughts and comments. Good morning, Ranking Member Bonamici. Well, thank you so much, and uh, Chair Bean, and it's a pleasure to welcome our witnesses and our colleagues on both sides of the aisle to the first hearing of the Subcommittee on Early Childhood Elementary and Secondary Education in the 118th Congress. Our public education system is a bedrock of our democratic republic, and I'll note that it's not a commodity. As noted by the Founding Fathers, numerous Supreme Court justices, and in many state constitutions, the provision of free, high-quality public education to all children serves a compelling community interest. This subcommittee is responsible for delivering on that mission. Unfortunately, the majority has decided to use our first subcommittee hearing of the 118th Congress not to focus on how we can strengthen public education, but rather to promote school privatization programs disguised as school choice. And as a result, today we're discussing programs that divert taxpayer dollars from public schools rather than identifying how we can improve public education so it prepares all students for success. As a policymaker and a parent, I certainly understand the importance of families having a voice in where and how they educate their children. My own daughter chose a public arts magnet school. My husband and I wholeheartedly supported her in that decision. And I've enthusiastically joined my colleagues in supporting funding for evidence-based school choice programs that empower parents, improve student outcomes, and increase diversity. I'm pleased to see bipartisan support for increased funding for the Federal Magnet Schools Assistance Program, which funds high-quality public magnet schools, educating more than 3.5 million students nationwide. Democrats on this committee support funding for inter- and intra-district choice programs which provide families and students with a meaningful opportunity to attend a public school that might better suit their needs. I highlight these choice programs because they're rooted in a common goal, the improvement and advancement of a public education that benefits all students. Vouchers, tax credit scholarships, education savings account, and charter schools with little accountability those types of programs my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are interested in discussing are antithetical to this goal for many reasons. The history of school voucher programs is engaged, ingrained in an active resistance to integration from white families across the South. Between 1954 and 1964, in the decade immediately following Brown versus Board of Education, Southern legislatures enacted more than 400 laws to undermine or disobey public school segregation. Many of these laws had the intent to or effect of draining resources from public schools to benefit private schools, often called segregation academies. It's important to learn from this history because from the mid-1960s to 1980s, amid court-ordered desegregation throughout the South, private school enrollment by mostly white students grew by more than 200,000 students. The legacy of these policies is that today, public schools, particularly those schools that serve students of color and students from low-income families, are often left underfunded and with fewer resources. My colleagues often claim that school privatization programs provide lower-income students with the opportunity to leave their public school in search of a better education. This is patently untrue in many, if not most, cases. Many choice programs do not require prior attendance at a public school as a prerequisite. And many programs, including the unprecedented expansion of vouchers passed in the chairman's home state of Florida this year, do not even have a family income cap. As a result, taxpayer dollars have been used to provide tuition coupons for students already in private schools and for wealthy families who don't need them. 
State data in Wisconsin show that two-thirds of students in the Choice Program were already enrolled in private schools before receiving the subsidy. Similarly, previous reports indicated that half of Indiana's voucher program recipients never attended a public school before joining the state program. Private school voucher programs also lack meaningful accountability requirements, leaving taxpayer money vulnerable to significant waste, fraud, and abuse. In Oklahoma, Arizona, Wisconsin, and Florida, for example, investigations have found millions of taxpayer dollars used by voucher schools to hire unqualified teachers, serve non-existent students, and pay for school administrators' personal expenses and items. Florida's recent expansion of its school voucher program to all elementary and secondary students, regardless of ho household income, is a brazen demonstration that its voucher program is meant to replace traditional public schools and eventually dismantle the public education system. It's also worth noting that state legislators from rural communities are apprehensive, and rightly so, about the utility and effectiveness of vouchers for their communities, as we saw during the failure of voucher bills in both Texas and Georgia this year. Many rural school districts are already underfunded and voucher policies would exacerbate their situation while providing no benefit to families who live there. I represent many rural communities and in most of them, the school is the community hub. There isn't another school within miles. We should not drain funds from them to support a meaningless choice. My Democratic colleagues and I also have serious concerns about the effects of school privatization on students' civil rights. Once a student enters voucher programs, they're left without most or even all of the civil rights protections and academic achievement standards that public schools are required to provide. Private schools participating in choice programs are not always required to honor students and families' civil rights protections, such as IEPs and 504 plans for students with disabilities, language services for students with limited English proficiency. Private school students may also be rejected or unnecessarily disciplined or expelled for reason that, reasons that would not be allowed at a public school, often with few or no avenues for recourse. Taxpayer dollars, which have clear state and federal accountability standards, have no, places, no place in schools like this. And contrary to proponents' claims, private school vouchers have also not been shown to improve students' education. If anything, they may hurt students' academic success. Research in states with live pri large private school voucher programs, Louisiana, Indiana, Ohio, shows that students using private school voucher score significantly lower on academic assessments than their public school peers. So in sum, private school choice programs drain resources from public education, can lead to wasteful and even fraudulent spending, deprive students and parents of civil rights protections, and do not improve student achievement. So, unfortunately, I'm disappointed to see my colleagues on the other side of the aisle supporting low-quality education options instead of following the evidence and the research. Instead, I invite my colleagues to join Democrats in investing in public education and evidence-based choice programs so every family can send their child to a high-quality, accountable, and safe public school. So thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses. I look forward to working with my colleagues to help every student succeed, and I yield back. Ms. Bonamici, thank you so much for your opening comments. Is it, it is indeed an exciting time in education across America. Uh, pursuant to Committee Rule 8C, all committee members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the clerk uh, in Word format by 5 p.m. after 14 days of the date of this hearing, which is May 3rd, 2023. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 14 days after the date of this hearing to allow such statements and other extraneous material reference uh, during the hearing to be submitted for the official record. You've waited long enough. Let's go to our first all-star panel. You thought you knew him. You see him in the hallways. He is the Honorable Warren Davidson. He represents Ohio's 8th District. But did you know he graduated from West Point and he served our country? Thank you for your service, uh, Congressman Davidson, in the Army, after the Army, here in the MBA from Notre Dame and has done a variety of different things. But most importantly, he was instrumental in the debate on the historic Bill of Rights bill that this body passed, what, a week and a half, two weeks ago, whenever we did, uh, recently, the Bill of Rights. Uh, he's got an idea of how we can expand choice. We're looking forward to hearing on uh, hearing from Congressman Davidson. Uh, Ranking Member Bonamici, you've brought a witness today too. Tell us who it is. Indeed, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have with us today Congressman Mark Pocan, who represents the Wisconsin 2nd Congressional District a position he's held since 2013. 
He's a small business owner, a union member, and a lifelong advocate for progressive causes. In previous Congresses, he served on this very committee, and I want to add that we miss his voice here on the Education uh, and Workforce Committee, but we're glad he's back as a witness today. Uh, so he currently serves, importantly, on the Appropriations Committee, where he sits on the Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Subcommittee and the Financial Services and General Government Subcommittee. Welcome, Representative Pocan. Thank you, Mr. Bonamici, and welcome, uh, Congressman Pocan. And finally, our third all-star witness of our first panel, Adrian Smith. You see him as well. Uh, so lengthy of all of the roles that he's done. Uh, sure, he represents Congress's, uh, uh, in Congress Nebraska's third district, but uh, prior to that, he was uh, an educator, a real estate agent, and served his hometown as member of the city council. But notably today, he has a bill. He has a bill also that's focused on expanding choice and letting kids and families uh, choose their own path uh, going forward. So uh, with that, let's get to our all-star panel. Welcome. We know y'all are on a tight schedule. So what we're going to do is allow each of you to speak as long as you want, as long as you stop after five minutes. So with that, let's get to... Uh, uh, Congressman Davidson, uh, you're on the gun, and uh, welcome to the committee. You are recognized, my friend. We're glad you're here. Thank you, Chairman Bean, Chairwoman Fox, and the rest of the committee for hosting me on this member panel today to talk about empowering parents and expanding school choice. I'm pleased the committee has decided to take this issue up so early in the 118th Congress, and it uh, was great to be able to support H.R. 5, the Parents' Bill of Rights, as it passed the House recently without an important amendment. Nevertheless, what is the proper role, uh, proper federal role for education policy? I think we can all agree that the status quo does not fit our various descriptions and expectations. Uh, while I do like Thomas Massey's one sentence bill ending the Department of Education, the reality is rather than quitting cold turkey, communities need us to actually unwind years of policies that have made schools dependent on federal dollars at the expense of their own local autonomy, local decision-making aligned with the views and values of their community. Uh, the surest remedy to accountability uh, for these dollars is to fund students via parents rather than schools. Courts have found that parents have vast authority when it comes to deciding how to raise and educate their children, and it's exciting to see under Republican leadership in the House that Congress is finally discussing uh, policy that reflects this reality. Parents have the right to determine their children's future, and it's uh, up to us to ensure that they have the tools they need to make informed decisions that align with their values and beliefs. This starts by removing unelected and unaccountable Washington bureaucrats from the classroom. People here in this town don't need to decide uh, things that parents are in empowered to decide. Uh, unfortunately, millions in taxpayer dollars currently prop up failing school systems that generate abysmal student outcomes year after year. Not to mention, they sideline parents throughout the entire process. A couple of weeks ago, I offered an amendment to HR 5 that if adopted, would have required local school districts that receive these federal dollars to hold an open enrollment period for children both inside and outside of their school district. It left details about how many and what criteria the schools could choose so long as they were not discriminatory and were made public. This proposal would have given parents the opportunity to pick the highest quality education for their child, no matter what zip code they live in. In 2023, roughly 80,000 students took advantage of open enrollment in my home state of Ohio. Participation has steadily increased over time, and it's thanks to the abundance of school choice options, leaders in my state have worked tirelessly to provide parents. Now, they have a lot of work left to do in Ohio, but one of the most popular programs, Ed Choice, provides K-12 scholarships to students who are assigned to underperforming schools, as well as to students whose families meet certain income designations. I think the principle should be that the money follows the student without these tests. Uh, Ohio's continue to expand eligibility for their school choice programs, in part because the results of these early programs have already been tremendous. Despite outcries from Democrats in teachers' unions, these programs have empowered parents with options and created competition among schools. Every student is different, and programs such as Ed Choice have encouraged schools to carefully tend to the needs of parents and their children who, if dissatisfied, can vote with their feet and move to a more fitting school 
for them. According to a 2022 study by the Thomas B. Fordham Institute located in Ohio, the academic achievement of district students was, quote, significantly higher than it would have been in districts, had districts not been exposed to the Ed Choice program. Ohio families are not the only ones reaping positive results of school choice programs, as was highlighted in opening remarks by the chairman. There has been an explosion of, choice, uh, of school choice legislation uh, introduced in states all around the country. And uh, if, while the COVID was horrible, one, one thing that's been positive has been the attention families have given to school choice. One of the many ways Congress could phase out the Department of Education is to simply consolidate federal funding we appropriate to the department in a, into block grants, which would be awarded to individual states based on how many citizens are in each state. Uh, this is another path versus the path that I offered in my amendment, and perhaps the most fitting in our Constitution. Uh, it is a republic, and if we gave these dollars to states, then the states, of course, would choose different courses of action, uh, but it would certainly get Washington out of it and empower states to do things differently. Uh, there's clearly not a, a uniform consensus as to which way to go, but it would certainly be more fitting for federal dollars to empower a more local form of government. Congress uses block grants in Washington for a variety of programs, and so I hope that we can move closer to a more constitutional form of government in all respects, but certainly with respect to education policy. And I yield. Mr. Davidson, thank you very much. We appreciate your thoughts. Let's go to, let's go to Wisconsin. Let's go to Wisconsin where, uh, Mr. Pocan, you are recognized. Welcome to committee and uh, we're glad to have you here. What say you on, uh, on education? Uh, full committee, thank you. Full committee chair uh, and the ranking member. Um, I appreciate the chance to testify for you uh, today. The title of today's hearing, School Choice, Expanding Educational Freedom for All, is somewhat ironic because the data on school choice shows that these programs drain resources from public schools to fund private and religious schools which aren't held to the same educational standards nor are subject to many of the anti-discrimination laws that protect LGBTQ plus students, students with disabilities, and students of color. I served for 14 years in the Wisconsin State Legislature during our one of the first in the nation school voucher experiments, and I'm glad to share some of the findings. Uh, vouchers fund students already attending private schools, not low-income kids. Let's be clear, voucher programs overwhelmingly subsidize kids who are already in private school. In Wisconsin, more than 70 to 80 percent of vouchers go to kids already in private school. Wisconsin's program started with 511 students in the 2013-14 school year and now has an enrollment of over 17,000 students. And each year the program has consistently enrolled more students from private schools than from public schools. Cutting their resources to subsidize kids attending private schools that their parents can already afford is not about education, it's really about tax breaks. Uh, second, vouchers don't save taxpayer dollars and drain funds from public schools. Additionally, these programs do not save taxpayer dollars. The cost of Wisconsin's statewide voucher program has grown from just over $3 million in 2013 to over $98 million less than a decade later. Wisconsin is effectively funding two separate school systems, one public, one private, out of limited state education funds. This puts a heavy financial burden on public schools and on taxpayers who have to foot the bill. My Republican colleagues often talk about their support for rural communities, but voucher programs hit rural schools particularly hard and put these communities at risk. I live in a rural community of 830 people myself. Rural communities can't afford to lose their public schools because of unaccountable voucher programs. Third, vouchers don't improve academic achievement. These programs also fail to improve academic achievement for students. Studies have shown that Milwaukee students using vouchers to attend private schools performed no better on standardized tests than their public school counterparts, and that the Milwaukee voucher program had no effect on students' likelihood of graduating college. Many voucher schools also shut down with little warning, abruptly forcing students to move to schools, public schools, and without returning a dime of public funding. One study shows that 41% of all private voucher schools operating in Milwaukee between 1991 and 2015 failed. Research also shows that academic outcomes tend to improve for students who choose to leave their voucher school for a public school. Fourth, 
Voucher schools lack accountability and oversight. Finally, for my colleagues who love to talk about accountability for federal spending, it's worth noting that these school choice programs have zero accountability for taxpayers. When Wisconsin first started the voucher program, the standards were incredibly loose. There was a school that used their government funds to lease Cadillacs. Another school that received funds was run by someone who said he could read a book simply by placing his hand on it. While eventually the standards were improved, voucher schools are not subject to the same requirements and oversight as public schools, meaning there's little to protect taxpayers from these types of abuses. It is clear that public funds belong in public schools, which serve all students regardless of whether they have special needs or their economic situation. The data shows that voucher programs lack basic oversight measures, sometimes fund discrimination, and fail to improve academic achievement for the students that participate. Our nation's public schools are already resource starved, struggling to fund livable salaries for teachers, basic infrastructure upgrades, or manageable classroom sizes. We need to invest in them for better results. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak today, and I yield back. Mr. Pocan, thank you so much. If you're just tuning in, we're talking Amer uh, America's educational choice and, uh, and where that leads and what we can do uh, with it. We're on part A of two all-star panels. We're going to Nebraska now, where the Honorable Adrian Smith is standing by. Uh, Congressman Smith, you are recognized. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chairman Bean, Chairwoman Fox, Ranking Member Bonamici, and Ranking Member, mem Ranking member Scott, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this important topic here in today's hearing. There's no question school choice is having a moment nationwide. Data shows parental involvement leads to better outcomes for students. And as legislators, we have a responsibility to encourage more parental involvement in, in education, not less. School choice is one way to do that. Parental empowerment is more important than ever before. It is inc incumbent upon us to come together and put forward creative solutions to ensure all children can access a quality education no matter their background or where they live. This was an issue near and dear to our friend and late colleague, Representative Jackie Walorski. While I wish Ms. Walorski were here testifying before you today, it is an honor to have carried forward her bill alongside Representative Burgess Owens, who serves on this important subcommittee. Our bill, the Educational Choice for Children Act, is an innovative policy mechanism to provide deserving students of all backgrounds with more options to fund their education needs, something we should all be able to agree on. It is important, and with emphasis, I note this measure leaves in place all existing public education resources. Let me repeat, this measure leaves in place all existing public education resources. The ECCA would create an annual $10 billion pool of tax credits which Treasury would allocate to private nonprofit scholarship granting organizations or SGOs in each state and in DC. These SGOs would receive donations from families and businesses, allowing them to provide scholarships to families below 300% of their state's median income. SGOs would then allocate one-for-one -one tax credits back to the donors and grant the scholarships to families. In addition to paying traditional tuition costs, the scholarships could also be used to pay for tutoring, supplies, and other needs for families in rural areas where their local district can't fully meet their needs and where traditional private school options do not exist. Because this process is run by private, non-governmental SGOs, there is no government involvement in providing, this, providing these scholarships. Because we do this through the tax code, once again, we are leaving in place all existing funding for education budgets. You may find this concept familiar because the structure of this tax incentive is similar to programs with strong bipartisan support, like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. The ECCA is supported by numerous stakeholders and advocates and I hope today's subcommittee hearing will pave the way for additional action on this important legislation. Thank you again for having me to discuss this ECCA and the importance of school choice to students and families across America. Thank you. Well, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Smith, Ms. Prokine. Thank you very much for coming forward. We appreciate. We know y'all are uh, y'all are excused. How about that? You are excused, uh, members. We're going to pause literally for just half a minute, 30 seconds as we excuse our first all-star panel, and then we invite the second all-star panel. Thank you very much. Well done. Our second all-star panel now making their way to the witness, witness table.
We are now looking for the witnesses for the second all-star panel. We found one. Hooray. Uh, you're, cho you're first. You get to choose. Your choice. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. This is the subcommittee on early childhood, elementary, and secondary education. We are in the middle of a discussion on education choice in America. We've already heard from one all-star panel, and now it's time for all-star panel number two. We've got four distinct, uh, distinguished witnesses that uh, we are going to hear from, and uh, we're glad to have you here. So welcome. For our first uh, witness introduction, let's go to our own uh, Mary Miller. You're recognized. Thank you so much to all of our witnesses for coming today. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Luke Messer, who is the president of Invest in Education. From 2013 to 2019, he served as the U.S. Congressman for Indiana's 6th Congressional District and was a member of this committee. He also served as a state legislator in the Indiana House of Representatives and was president and CEO of School Choice Indiana, where he helped pass major school choice legislation and usher in the largest state-based education reform movement in the country. Thank you, sir, for attending. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller, and welcome. We're glad to have you here. Uh, I defer to Ranking Member Bonamici to introduce our second witness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Derek W. Black is a professor of law and director of the Constitutional Law Center at the University of South Carolina School of Law. His area of expertise includes education law and policy, constitutional law, and civil rights. The focus of his current scholarship is the intersection of constitutional law and public education, particularly as it pertains to educational equity and equality and fairness for disadvantaged students. His work has been cited by federal courts in various briefs before the United States Supreme Court. Based on that research, he offers expert witness testimony in school funding, voucher and federal educational policy litigation. He holds a JD from the University of the North Carolina School of Law. Thank you very much and welcome, uh, Mr. Black. Uh, Nathaniel Moran, uh, Congressman Moran, you're recognized to introduce our third witness. Thank you, Chair. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Lindsey Burke, who is the director of the Center for Education Policy at the Heritage Foundation. She has published evaluations of education choice options for public policy foundations across the country. And if that were not enough, she has also done extensive work shaping and evaluating policies on education savings accounts. She holds a PhD in education policy from George Mason University, where she examined the intersection of education choice and institutional theory. We are grateful, ma'am, that you have joined us today and look forward to hearing from you. Please welcome Dr. Lindsey Burke. Thank you, Ms. Moran, and welcome, Dr. Burke. I have the honor of introducing our fourth witness. Uh, it's Denisha Allen. She's a senior fellow at the American Federation for Children and previously served as school choice and youth liaison for the Secretary of Education at the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, she's from the free state of Florida. Uh, she is a tax scholarship graduate who had her life changed by being able to choose the school that, that she chose. Uh, she's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Examiner, and Fox News. But 
Most importantly, uh, we discovered that we share a passion for the Jaguars out of Jacksonville, because that's where you're from. We're glad to have you here. You probably got one of the best jobs ever, making families, uh, just changing lives of uh, helping them navigate their way through uh, school choice. So with that, uh, panelists, we're glad to have you here. Uh, there's a five-minute uh, warning. Your lights will light up. Maybe I'll give you the signal if you go uh, forward. But we're glad to have you here, and uh, just welcome. Uh, Welcome back to our first witness, Mr. Messer. We, uh, Drew Strauss, you lost, so you're going first. So we are delighted to have you here. Welcome back. So Mr. Messer, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Bean, Ranking Member Bonamici, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. It is great to be back in this hearing room. As a former member of the Education and Workforce Committee, former president of a state school choice organization, and former state legislator, I've worked for many years to reform K-12 education with a particular emphasis on expanding educational freedom and parental empowerment in K-12 education. This month marks the 40th anniversary of A Nation at Risk, arguably the most important document assessing the state of K-12 education ever published by the federal government. 40 years later, not enough has changed. The truth is, we're a long way away from having a 21st century K-12 education model where every student has access to a great education, and schools are laser-focused on learning and improving academic outcomes for students. The pandemic exposed a disturbing underlying political dynamic that too often places the interests of adults above the welfare, both emotionally and academically, of students. The result was a widespread documented learning loss that will take years to recover. During the pandemic, with millions of students learning from home, America's parents also got a much better look at the substance of what is being taught in our nation's schools. Unfortunately, many schools are driving an agenda that has little to do with reading, writing, math, science, art, music, or history. Thanks to the leadership of Representative Letgo, Chairwoman Fox, and many other members of this committee, the House recently passed a bill the Parents' Bill of Rights, which is intended to ensure that parents have a much stronger voice in our nation's schools. But importantly, school choice is the engine that makes the Parents' Bill of Rights enforceable. Parents need the freedom to choose the education environment that best meets their child's needs. Parents, especially lower income parents, need the power to be able to leave government assigned schools that aren't working for their child. Parents need school choice. The great myth about school choice is that it allegedly hurts public schools. Decades into this debate, school choice is an experiment no longer. In America today, there are 3.5 million students in public charter schools. There are around 700,000 students benefiting from a voucher, tax credit, scholarship, or education savings account. Yet the public school system is still standing and still educating the vast majority of our nation's students. In fact, more than 20 years of research compiled by Ed Choice shows that the existence of school choice actually improves academic achievement in surrounding public schools. School choice is also incredibly popular. In America today, it's hard to find a public policy issue on which Republican, Democrat, Independent, Latino, African American, and Millennial voters all agree. Yet poll after poll shows 70 to even 90 percent support for these groups from various forms of school choice. Congress can heed the call from voters and parents of school-aged children and pass America's boldest school choice bill, H.R. 531, the Educational Choice for Children Act. Authored by Representative Smith, who did a great job describing the bill earlier today, my friend Burgess Owens, and then my late colleague from Indiana, Jackie Walorski. The ECCA represents federalism and ensures K-12 education remains a state and local issue, creates no new mandates or government programs, protects religious liberty and private school autonomy. It does this by creating a $10 billion federal tax credit that allows individuals and businesses to contribute to nonprofit scholarship granting organizations in the states. These SGOs provide scholarships for students to use for a variety of educational purposes, such as tuition, tutoring to address learning loss, special needs services, school-related fees, education technology, or curriculum materials. That's private money, not federal money, to fund scholarships. 
while donors get 100% non-refundable tax credit. Once implemented, the ECCA would provide educational opportunities for more than a million families throughout the country. Imagine how different the policy debate would have been throughout the pandemic if one million families could have voted with their feet. Mr. Mester, thank you so much. You haven't lost it. You still stayed under time, so uh, we're <laughs> glad to have you back. Let's go to our second. Is, it's Mr. Black. Mr. Black, uh, welcome again, and you were recognized. And your mic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's my honor to testify before the committee. I want to focus my comments on four issues in particular, state's constitutional duty in education, the financial impact of vouchers on public education, unequal access and discrimination in voucher programs, and student achievement. First, public financing of vouchers must be situated within a larger constitutional context. The key question is whether private school subsidies are permissible under state constitutions. All 50 state constitutions mandate the provision of public education. These mandates are affirmative and absolute, and they include qualitative components. Both constitutional language and courts describe these obligations as states' paramount or foremost duty, which is to say that no other priorities can come before them. Various state constitutional clauses also directly limit states' involvement in, private, in financing private school education and reserve certain resources exclusively for public schools. The purpose of those restrictions is to ensure states remain wedded to public education as their top priority and that public funds do not get diverted elsewhere to the detriment of public schools. Provisions of these sorts, for instance, have required the Florida, Nevada, and South Carolina Supreme Courts most recently to strike down voucher programs. It's also worth emphasizing that these state constitutional education clauses are a function of the United States constitutional mandate that Congress guarantee a Republican form of government in the states. Since the nation's founding, the provision of public education has been understood as a central pillar of American democracy and a Republican form of government. This understanding is reflected in one of the nation's four foundational documents, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which actually precedes the United States Constitution and in the terms that Congress has imposed on states as a condition of admission to the Union. Second, various studies strongly suggest that many, if not most, states are failing to meet their constitutional obligations regarding public school funding, and these shortfalls tend to increase when states adopt voucher and voucher-like programs. One study found that states disinvested nearly $600 billion in public schools following the Great Recession. During the same period, several states exponentially expanded their private school choice programs. For instance, a 2022 report rated Florida's funding level and its public schools as an F, its funding effort as an F, and its distribution of funds amongst those schools as a D. At the same time, Florida spends roughly $1 billion a year on private school tuition. Conversely, states with the highest public education funding ratings do not typically support voucher programs. It is also worth emphasizing that even when public schools lose students, Many of their costs relating to transportation, facilities, utilities, and personnel remain fixed. As a result, public schools must provide the same services but with fewer resources. Third, private schools participating in these programs do not provide equal access to all students. They are exempt from various anti-discrimination and constitutional restrictions. And evidence suggests that some of these schools are, in fact, discriminating against students in admission as well as providing questionable curriculum. In addition, states have increasingly changed their programs from expanding opportunity for low-income students to simply subsidizing private school tuition for all students. And no matter what, private schools continue to pick and choose from student applicants based upon academic credentials and other factors such as behavioral history. The net results are publicly financed programs that help to sort, segregate, and stratify students into demographic silos. These dynamics pose serious challenges for our democracy and run contrary to the governmental role in education. If government is no longer willing to pursue its democratic goals, the rationale for publicly financing education evaporates. Fourth, many school choice proponents incorrectly believe that private schools and thus tuition programs offer an academic advantage over public schools. While the average test score in private schools is higher, this is a function of the fact that private schools are demographically distinct from public schools. When comparing apples to apples, public schools slightly outperform private schools. And studies, more specifically of voucher programs, show that students enrolling in these programs prefer, often perform worse than their similarly situated peers in public schools. 
Congress and states have never fully achieved their goals in public schools. But public education has, as much as any aspect of the American story, been a central pillar of achieving what Abraham Lincoln called a more perfect union. Now is not the time to abandon this crucially important project, but to redouble our efforts and recommit to its premises. Our state constitutions and national credos do not allow for anything less. Thank you. Well done, Mr. Black. Thank you very much. Our fourth panelist is Ms. Allen. Uh, Ms. Allen, welcome again, and you are recognized. And that microphone. Yep. Thank you so much, Representative Bean, um, and for all the leadership for having me here today. I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, um, on the east side of Jacksonville. My neighborhood sits um, on the uh, east side of downtown near the arena where the Jaguars play, um, and it's closed off by Springfield. By all accounts, the east side of Jacksonville should be a prosperous neighborhood, but the reality is far different. It's been the focus of many projects in the city, um, but in statistics tell a sad tale. The median household income is half that of the citywide average. You can buy and sell drugs easily. Crime is high. This neighborhood is where I went to school, and I failed the third grade twice because I could not read. I felt so insecure. Um, I just knew I was stupid. I was regularly humiliated by my classmates because I was two years older than everyone in my class. Teachers sighed when I walked through the door. Unsurprisingly, I hated school. To me, school was just a place that I had to go out of obligation so my mother wouldn't go to jail because that had actually happened before. But the summer before my sixth grade year, I started to live permanently with my godmother. I thought that I was a failure, and it seemed that my life would follow the same path of many folks in my family, dropping out or worse. But when I started to live with my godmother, one of the first things she wanted to do was put me in a great school. She found out about the Florida Tax Credit Scholarship and immediately enrolled me into her church's private school. I didn't know my life was going to change as much as it did. Every day at my new school, the teachers greeted me with a smile. I felt so loved and seen. Because I didn't read on level, teachers met with me one-on-one -on -one to catch me up. They saw the potential that was in me. My confidence began to grow. They didn't view me as a chore, but as a child of God and as a student that was capable of learning. I went from making Ds and Fs consistently believing that I would be a teen parent, a high school dropout, to making A's and B's, graduating from high school, becoming the first in my family to do so, undergrad, and earning my master's degree. I now work full time to create more opportunities for students nationwide. I learned that I was not a failure, but the public school system had failed me. Imagine all the students who are like I once was, students who are trapped in failing, poor performing schools, who don't read on grade level, who are destined to drop out, become a teen parent, spend the rest of their life behind bars. Imagine the students who are sitting in the back of the classroom being overlooked, even the students who are gifted, who are not being challenged enough, and telling all of those beautiful faces that there is a feasible alternative, that their liberation is in the form of education freedom but only if their state leaders prioritize their students' needs above systems. Students in this country deserve a K-12 option that is beyond the singular one the government has assigned to them. Yet in many states, the opportunity for America's students remain out of reach. Florida, my home state, is a bright exception. Over 100,000 black students in Florida are enrolled in their non-district schools. And for context, that means that there are more black students in Florida that are enrolled in choice programs than 30 states have black students overall. School choice does not just benefit students who have left district schools. As school choice has been expanded in the state of Florida, districts have also, the district schools have also seen strong academic gains, both outpacing black students nationally and narrowing the achievement gap between white students in Florida. The sad reality is that many states will never access this, students in states will never access this life-changing opportunity unless Congress acts. There are many proposals to provide more options to parents, 
but the Education Choice for Children Act would allow education freedom now more than ever. School choice is a rising tide that lifts all boats. My own life is a reflection of that data, and as someone who saw firsthand the power that it's had in my life, I can't wait to see the amazing things that happen across the country. I encourage Congress to act swiftly to ensure that no child is left behind. Thank you. Ms. Allen, thank you so much, and thanks for coming and sharing uh, your story. We're going to go to Q&A, questions from members. And members, uh, everybody has five minutes. We have five minutes ourselves. Here's the list that I have right now, and if this is not correct, uh, whisper in my ear. But questions will go in the order of Bean, Mata Michi, McLean, Norcross, Moran, Sablon, Williams, Bowman, Miller, Wilson, Owens, Hayes, Kylie, Scott, Fox. After we get and hear from Dr. Burke, because Dr. Burke, we're not going to forget about you. Uh, we're glad to have you here. So, Dr. Burke, uh, let's go ahead and give you five minutes, too. Thank you. Welcome. I, I think I get six minutes now. Amen. Actually. Um, <laughs> My name is Lindsay Burke. I'm the director of the Center for Education Policy at the Heritage Foundation. The views I express in this testimony are my own and should not be construed as representing any official position of the Heritage Foundation. Thank you, Chairman Bean and Ranking Member Bonamici for the opportunity to testify today. Over the past decade, states have increasingly adopted private school choice options such as vouchers, tax credit scholarships, and education savings accounts. As of March of this year, 13 states have education savings accounts, or ESA-style accounts, 15 have school voucher options, and 21 give families access to tax credit scholarships. What began as an earnest academic idea proffered by Nobel laureate economist Milton Friedman in 1955 in his seminal essay, The Role of Government in Education, has now become mainstream public policy, a cornerstone of state efforts to restore parental control in education and improve learning outcomes for students. And the benefits of education choice are numerous. And as school choice options expand, these benefits are being demonstrated empirically through a growing body of scientific research. To date, researchers have conducted 18 randomized control trial evaluations of the effect of school choice on students' academic achievement. RCTs are the gold standard of scientific research because differences in, in the outcome variable of interest between the control group and the experiment groups can be attributed to the policy intervention in question as a result of randomization, enabling researchers to draw causal conclusions to a high degree of certainty. Of the 18 RCTs conducted on the academic achievement impacts of school choice, 12 find positive effects for some or all students, four find neutral effects, and two find negative effects. The bulk of scientifically rigorous evaluations are unambiguous about the positive academic effects of school choice on students' outcomes. In addition to improving academic achievement, access to school choice significantly increases students' likelihood of graduating from high school and enrolling in college. Of the seven experimental evaluations conducted to date on the effect of school choice on academic attainment, six find statistically significant positive effects for some or all students, and one finds null effects. No rigorous studies find a negative effect on academic attainment. One study is particularly noteworthy, a congressionally mandated evaluation of the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program, a voucher option for children from low-income families right here in the nation's capital. Participating students were 21 percentage points more likely to graduate than their students who did not receive a scholarship in the control group. You will be hard-pressed to find another policy intervention as successful as the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program has been. But school choice is important because it is providing accountability to families. When an assigned public school is poor performing, families in areas with education choice now have the ability to hold that public school accountable by taking their child's share of education funding elsewhere. And this is more critical than ever. On the most recent administration of the National Assessment of Educational Progress, student math scores fell eight points for eighth graders and reading scores declined three points. Experts say this is the equivalent of wiping out two decades worth of learning gains. Overall, across the country, just 26% of eighth graders are proficient in math and just 31% are proficient in reading. Although school choice is primarily a state policy, there is a role for Congress to play in advancing education freedom. 
starting with areas over which Congress has ultimate authority. It should secure and expand the highly successful DC Opportunity Scholarship Program, formula funding the program, transitioning it from a voucher to an education savings account, and making it universally available to all DC children. It should make IDEA and Title I funding portable following families, following children to schools of choice. It should provide education savings accounts to Native American children who are currently trapped in underperforming Bureau of Indian Affairs schools. And it should provide education savings accounts to children from active duty military families. Education Choice provides a needed course correction aligning K-12 education with the rest of the American experience, one based on free choice and the accountability to consumers created through competition, even in the case of publicly funded programs. Pell Grant recipients aren't assigned to particular colleges because they receive a Pell Grant. Food stamp recipients aren't assigned to the grocery store that is closest to their home. Yet in K-12 education, students are assigned to a school that is closest to where their parents can afford to live, even if that school is a poor fit. It is time to break the link between housing and schooling and fund families directly, just as we do in every other aspect of American life. Thank you. Well done, Dr. Burke. Thank you so much. And Mr. Mester, thank you for the gentle nudge to uh, make sure our full panel has, uh, has testified. We're going, now we are going to Q&A, and I've got the list members of, uh, I know there's several different committees going at once, so put the clock on, Bean, and let's get started. Uh, first of all, Dr. Burke, welcome. There's a, a group that says money. It's all about money, and we need to funnel more money to public schools, but you and I talked earlier, that may not be the case. There are some states that spend a whole bunch more and may not get. Can you comment on on money. Is it all about money, Dr. Burke? It's not about the money at all. And thank you for the question, Chairman Bean. You mentioned New York. New York City is now spending north of $38,000 per student per year. And if we look across the country, we know that we see- Now, now Dr. Burke, if they're spending 38,000, that's not per student. Is that per student? That is per student per year. So they are probably far and ahead getting the best results. Is that right? You Spending know, if that money much money? Mattered, if money mattered, that would probably be the case. But to your point, money doesn't matter. There's no correlation between spending and academic achievement and the research literature that's out there. And we're now spending nationally over $17,000. That's revenue per pupil per year. And we can look at the private school sector. You can look at the Catholic school sector in particular. Catholic schools are spending less than half of what we're spending per pupil in the public system and getting results that are far beyond what we see in traditional district schools across the country. So money just simply doesn't matter. It's not about how much we spend, it's about who controls those dollars. That should be parents. So is it true there's an argument, and I say this sometimes, and is this correct or not? I mean, we can either fund the system or fund the student. Is that clarifying and we get better results of funding the students? Would so, you agree? As a general rule, we should absolutely move toward funding children, not systems. And we should fund the student. We should not fund a system to which we assign a student based on where their family can afford to buy a home. That is an inequitable way of funding K-12 education. So we should move in that direction, certainly. And this is what states are doing across the country, state after state now are recognizing, just as Milton Friedman did, that just because we publicly finance education does not require government delivery of schooling. And so that's what Education Choice does. It separates the financing of education from the delivery of schooling and funds families directly, enables them to choose learning environments that are safe and effective and reflect their values. Thank you, Dr. Burke. So I want to say, huh, money doesn't mean more money doesn't automatically mean better results. So that's, that's good takeaway from, if we only learned that from this meeting, then we would be further ahead had we not known that point. Uh, Ms. Allen, what a tremendous testimony you have given. I think you have the greatest job ever, changing families' lives, knowing that they can access, uh, to be part of that uh, million uh, African Americans who are attending public s school choice in, uh, in the free state of Florida. There's a, uh, you may know this, there's the KIPP school on the west side of Jacksonville that has a fantastic statistic that is a game changer. The chance of someone attending public schools and going to college is less than 5% in Jacksonville when they attend public schools. But if they attend KIPP school, that, uh, that, that number goes to over 80%. What's it like changing lives with a family, giving them the, the hope that uh, they can send their cool school, uh, they can send their kid to the school of their choice? What's that like? 
Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing to put, quite frankly, um, based on my personal experience, not knowing what was going to be possible, what potential lies, just following the same path as members in my family, but now working in this space to ensure that students across the country are given access to a high quality education is monumental. During my time um, in Florida as an advocate, the teachers union sued the Florida program twice. I was filming a commercial once to tell the teachers union to drop the suit. During this time, there was a little boy who was fearful that he would be ejected from his school, who looked up to me crying, saying, would I, am I gonna have to leave my school? And that was very disheartening to know that there are, um, there are forces that don't want kids to be in learning environments that's meeting their ultimate need. Um, because there are communities of schooling that's meeting them. Thank you. I was there when they Step Up for Students did a march on Tallahassee, and it was truly empowering. Uh, Mr. Messer, welcome back again. And uh, briefly, uh, in all of 30 seconds, what do we need to do to continue the march to bring uh, the uh, educational choice across America? What do we need to do? The keys, parents. You, you know, you mentioned money may not make a difference. What does matter is engaged parents. And when you have school choice policies that empower parents to help shape the future of their child, you get better results. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes my time. Up next will be Bonamici, McLean, Norcross, Moran. Uh, ranking member Bonamici, you are recognized. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I find it very concerning that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle consistently criticize public schools and then highlight what they see as their shortcomings, many of which are the product of decades of disinvestment while proposing policies that would drain more resources from public schools and decrease their capacity to effectively serve. And I want to emphasize all students, because as we know, uh, the voucher schools and charter schools, they don't all take all students. And when you adjust for all of those factors, I think it's baffling to say that funding doesn't matter. It does. Uh, but I'm going to ask my question to Professor Black. I appreciate your expertise on civil rights and particularly your scholarship highlighting the benefits of equal access to public education. You know, for decades, civil rights laws, Title IX, IDEA, ESEA, those have significantly dis decreased discrimination and contributed to the goal of providing all students with the opportunity to get a high quality education. So how can absolving schools, especially private religious schools from following civil rights laws affect students and families who may choose a private school as part of a choice program. And, if, and Professor, if you can bring the microphone a little closer, I think we'll have easier time hearing you. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think as one of my colleagues once said, the further our children get away from public schools, the less we can, can protect them. Can you them. raise it up just a little bit? Thank you. I said the further we get, the further children get away from public schools, the less we have the capacity to protect them. And, you know, you mentioned in your opening remarks um, that ultimately the more Milton Friedman's initial arguments were laid dormant regarding private school choice and it really was not until the state of Virginia decided that it wanted to resist the desegregation of public schools there that there was any takers in the public school sector. Um, African American children at least at that that time chose to stay home rather than to participate in a private segregated system. Now of course a lot has changed since then but as you point out States consistently refuse to apply anti-discrimination uh, anti-discrimination standards in their private school programs. In fact, you know, when we have hearings like this and people insist there must be accountability, there must be anti-discrimination uh, protections, religion, gender, sex, there is always, almost always a refusal to include those provisions uh, in those programs. And so students are left to a market. Uh, that can deal with them instead of students dealing with the market. Right, and I, I want to get to a couple more questions, Professor Black, uh, and, and, I, and I want to know, I'm going to ask about students with disabilities, but I just want to know, like, I, I think about our role as policymakers. I think about all the students who are in the school. Ms. Allen, I'm awesome that you're doing well. I think about all the students who are in the school you left. Our obligation is to them as well. Professor Black, I want to ask you about students with disabilities. Um, they're, I know they're participating in school choice programs. So where are they going and what do the schools do to meet their needs? You know, traditional public schools have infrastructure. They have specialized personnel. They have teachers. They have speech and occupational therapists. They have adaptive equipment. So what happens when students with disabilities go to some of these schools and how would unenrollment of some students with disabilities and the money provided 
um, diminish the services to students with disabilities who remain in public, traditional public schools? Well, so two things. N number one, the IDEA protections which you referenced do not follow the students there. And in fact, some states have required students, although it's not always transparent, to sort of waive any uh, disability rights they may have as a condition of accepting uh, enrollment in a private voucher program. So that's number one. Uh, number two, when you have fewer special education students enrolling in the private system, what you really have is a concentration of them in the public system, which again has an increased cost in the public system. It's losing students who may be easier to educate or cheaper to educate, but retaining the higher cost students. Public schools don't object to that, but there is a financial consequence to it. And, and they may come, go back to public school and then not get the funding, as Mr. Pocan pointed out. Uh, my, my third question, Professor Black, some people, including some here today, have posited that a massive multi-billion, up to $10 billion school choice federal tra tax credit would not affect public school funding, which I find a bit baffling because it seems like $10 billion less in revenue that could be used, for example, for fully funding IDEA. So do you agree, uh, and why or why not? Well, as you point out, the federal government has yet to fully fund the IDEA and the history of the program, so any dollar spent elsewhere would be a dollar not, not spent there. And I think to take that same point, as I always emphasize at the state level, until you have discharged your constitutional responsibility to the public education program, I don't believe it's appropriate to consider alternatives to that program because there's an absolute obligation there. And, and, and just to clarify, a $10 billion school choice federal tax credit would reduce federal revenue by $10 billion, isn't that correct? That's true, and if we look at the state level, any type of tax credits, you know, movement of dollars from one system to the other does have the effect either directly coming out of the public education funding program or indirectly coming out of Absolutely. it. Absolutely, and Mr. Chairman, I, I see my time has expired, but as I yield back, I request unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter <coughs> from the National Coalition for Public Education encouraging Congress to reject private school vouchers. Without objection. There's been a lineup in our order. Owens, Norcross, Moran, Sablon, Williams. Let's go with, uh, let's go to Utah where uh, Mr. Owens is ready for his uh, time. Uh, Congressman, you recognize. You. Thank you so much, uh, doc, Mr. Dr. Fox and uh, Chairman Bean. We're holding this important hearing today and I thank you uh, to the witness for your participation. I'd particularly like to thank my colleague, Represent Representative Adrian Smith. It's been a pleasure to work with him on this Educational Choice for Children's Act that we introduced earlier this year in honor of our colleague, Jackie Borlorski. I'd also like to thank former Representative Luke Messer, who's been a long, long time champion of school choice. Representative Messer long ago, long ago caught the vision of school choice and how transformative educational freedom is for families, especially those in low income and unperforming school districts. Educational freedom is a civil rights issue of our time. Educational freedom supports students over systems and gives every child in America, regardless of his or her zip code, the opportunity to achieve the American dream. I've seen firsthand how access to quality education can change the course of child, a child's life. Educational freedom can give someone a second chance in life. I am passionate and will not stop fighting until every child, regardless of his or her race, socioeconomic status, family situation, or neighborhood, has the right educational freedom. Uh, I, I, it was a little bit earlier, somebody stated that uh, no public rationale to support choice. Uh, I'm going to disagree vehemently on that. This is a civil rights issue. Every child has a right for an education. Every child has a right for a choice of going to the right place. And, and I, I think it's interesting because as we talk now about how $10 billion is a, it pulls away from our revenue. I mean, of all times to talk about using that, op, that, 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 that example. Let me just go back. We have Miss Allen here. That is a great example of what can happen with a choice. Let me tell you about the other kids who have not had a choice. 2017, 75%, 75% of the black boys in the state of California cannot pass standard reading and writing tests. 75%, no choice. Their parents didn't have the chance to have this opportunity we're talking about right now. If you want to see the results of that, look what's going on in the streets of California across the board in every single urban city where these kids have not been taught how to read, write, think, or dream. 100% of the black kids here in DC in one district a zero proficiency in math. Now, it's one thing to, to com commit to public schools. If it's a bad school system, why should we, not, why should we put our kids in there? Why should you put your kids in there? And I would, I would suggest no one on the, in this room would purposely keep their kids in a school that's failing and say it's okay. 
but some, some way we put aside this empathy and say it's okay for other kids, particularly blacks, Hispanics, those who cannot defend themselves. There is a result of us allowing this system not to have meritocracy put into this process. I want to address this real quick, uh, Mr. Messer. Uh, the, uh, the Educational Choice for, for Children's Act, uh, how does this impact the uh, resources for public education? I think it's very important because this is what unions like to do is put fear in people's hearts. How does this impact those educational systems already in place right now? Yeah. Uh, first, Congressman Owens, thank you for your great leadership on the ECCA. Um, yeah, as, as you talk through this, I think it's important to remember uh, you might be entitled to your own argument, but you're not entitled to your own facts, right? There are $200 billion in COVID monies that are out in schools across America, $100, million, 100 billion, forgive me, we're in Washington, $100 billion of which um, have not even been spent. Um, the money that would be used for this tax credit, it's not federal government money, it's the money of the individuals who would decide to give their private contributions to private SGOs and then create better opportunities for kids. You, know, you were describing what's happening across America and what happens to the kids that don't get a chance. I once had a chance to speak at the Basis Academy here in Washington, D.C., this extraordinary mathematics academy, math and science academy with kids from every zip code in Washington, D.C., with graduation rates in the high 90s, 80 plus percent, 90 plus percent going to college. The first question they asked me was, Congressman, why don't my friends and neighbors have this same chance? Yeah. Why don't sometimes even my sibling or cousin have this same opportunity? It's immoral in a country like ours. No child should be forced to go to a failing or unsafe school. I only have a few seconds here, and I'll just say this. Uh, if you want a voice of those who are not being heard, those who say we represent, listen to Ms. Allen, please. Ms. Allen, do you have any, any, com any last comments on this, this, this topic of choice? I would just like to reiterate what you said, that this is a civil rights issue of our time. I look at Baltimore, that's not too far from here, where dismal academic um, reports are pretty much every week being highlighted by the media. The scholarship program there is $3,000, but the average per pupil spending is $21,000. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Our order is Sablon Moran Bowman Williams. Uh, let's go to uh, Congressman Sablon from uh, the Northern Mariana Islands. You are recognized and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And good morning to our witnesses. Welcome. I'm trying to figure out if we want most of our students to aspire to those coming out of charter schools when what we should really do is improve our public schools so that they could all, you know, not just a few. But uh, Professor Black, um, and again, proponents of school choice um, say that it will positively affect all schools and children. Is that true, sir? I'm sorry, I missed the last couple of words there. All right. Uh, it is said that school choice will positively affect all schools and children. Is that true? Positively affect? It's hard for me to conceive as to how school choice would positively affect all schools given the financial impacts of private school choice on public school budgets. And particularly given um, uh, there was discussion earlier as to whether money matters. And the research consensus uh, of decades is that in fact public school funding levels are positively correlated to student achievement, and in fact, even those who have questioned it when, when put on the stand in court have conceded that, of course, not all money matters. If we waste money, it doesn't matter, but that money spent uh, on things that matter in public schools have a very positive impact um, on student achievement. So I don't understand how removing funds from them could have so, a positive effect. And again, uh, Professor, uh, our colleagues on the other side uh, of the I would like to frequently point out that this, the word education is uh, not found in the United States Constitution when they're trying to justify school choice uh, programs and funding private elementary and secondary uh, schools. Can you speak, please speak to the history of public education as a founding principle of our great nation? 
That's a long story. I'll try to be brief. Um, but I'll at least Thank say you. that our yeah. founding fathers, such as Jefferson and Adams in particular, well, Madison uh, and Washington, were all keenly uh, aware of the problem of an educated citizenry, even prior to the United States Constitution. And the notion was that we had to provide public education to have an educated citizenry so that we could have a Republican form of government. This sort of concept of a Republican form of government with public education as its pillar was there before the United States Constitution. I referenced earlier the Northwest Ordinance of, of, of 1787. Um, many of the people who voted on that, Continental Congress, which preceded this one, are also the same people who, who uh, attended the United States Constitutional Convention. Um, but the, that Northwest Ordinance of 1787 required that every single square inch of land that remained in the United States of America outside of the original colonies would be divided up into squares, right, and that each town would have 32 lots. The 16th lot in each town would be reserved for public schools. The outer lying lots would generate resources for those schools. Anyone who's driven from Pennsylvania into Ohio or from Kentucky into Ohio, and they used to carry around those little maps, will notice something very different. The lines between the counties in Ohio and every county that goes westward are straight. That is because the Northwest Ordinance and the, and the standards that it set for territories to become states in the United States of America. After the Civil War, Congress never admitted another state to this union without requiring them to mandate public education in their state constitution. So yes, it is the role of states to provide public education, but that is a function of the overall constitutional structure of a Republican form of government in the United States of America. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you very much. Let's go to New York, where Representative Williams is standing by, and you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my wife and I both uh, attended public high schools, and she performed much better than I did. She was valedictorian, and I will not comment further. Uh, but in our choice, in our family, we actually decided to homeschool our children. And uh, we actually did that across I think five or six different uh, jurisdictions, uh, including different states, uh, always having to interpret the rules and to comply with the rules. And that uh, re required a lot of effort. And again, I salute my fantastic wife for the success of our children through that process and their ongoing success as, children, as, uh, as adults. Um, in my district, just in the last uh, month, I have visited two fantastic schools. Uh, the first is the Fremont Elementary School, uh, part of East Syracuse Manoa School District. It is a uh, public school. Uh, it's extremely uh, well run and well organized, has tremendous outcomes, it has great leadership, and most of all, it has great teachers. Uh, Dr. Desiato, uh, who runs that uh, school district, is uh, is truly exceptional in her work, and I commend her. In the poorest parts, or, or adjacent or near the poorest parts of Syracuse, there's another school. It's called the Syracuse Science Academies of New York, and it's a charter school uh, run by Dr. Tolga uh, Hayali, and also has spectacular success. Uh, truly enjoyed uh, getting to read my favorite books to a second grade class there and answer questions about life on submarines. And so just in my district, uh, we have two fantastic examples of both public schools and charter schools. And yet also in my district, we have some of the poorest schools and some of the least worst performing schools. And I find that unfair. Um, Mrs. Allen, you are the star of the show. Uh, thank you for being here, with all respect to, uh, to the others. But your personal story is, uh, is truly inspiring. Um, in your area of Jacksonville, where were the best public schools that you were aware of in Jacksonville? Um, so actually, uh, unfortunately, there are still no schools of choice on the east side of Jacksonville where I grew up. And the schools that 
were underperforming when I went are still underperforming. Um, Which were the best performing in the greater Jacksonville area? What it would have been best? on the more affluent side of the of the city, um, on the south side, um, in the San Marco downtown area. Um, private schools were probably the the best pick for families. So, it, it seems like a simple solution. Why didn't your family simply move into the wealthy neighborhoods? We or couldn't attend, afford it. <laughs> or perhaps attend the private uh, schools. Yep, we couldn't afford it. Uh, we do have a system of choice in this country, to your point, uh, and it's based on zip code. If you can afford to buy a house in a wealthy community, you have school choice. But unfortunately, parents don't have that opportunity. Lower income parents, even lower middle class parents, don't have that opportunity to pay for a house in a great district. Approximately how many miles would you say it is between the uh, east side of your neighborhood and uh, some of these south side schools that uh, um, were high performing? Approximately how many miles would you I say? I would say about five miles from Jacksonville to a, a great school, um, which is just right across the river. And so your um, opportunity to attend um, a school of your choice did it require that you move? No, it didn't. Um, actually, I was able to go to a private school on scholarship and drive to that school. We didn't have to move from the, the neighborhood, yeah. So you were able to stay in your neighborhood, and because of the choice, you were able to markedly change um, your education opportunities. That's right. Okay. Well, I think that's a, a wonderful uh, story and uh, seems like the easiest solution to overcome geography um, and a lot of the um, discrepancy that we see uh, in our public school system. So thank you for sharing your testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's stay in New York where Mr. Bowman is standing by and ready for his five minutes. He is recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for being here. I want to start by saying that I went to public schools my entire life. Um, and I received an excellent education in my public schools, and now I'm sitting here as a member of Congress after beating a 31-year incumbent uh, in 2020 without taking any corporate back money. So that's pretty impressive, I would say. Um, so I just wanted to add that for the record. Dr. Burke, you mentioned that New York City schools spend how much per student? So uh, it just came out, $38,000, north of $38,000. $38,000, and that's based on what year's data? Uh, most recent available data. So the From past which year? 2021, 2022. So 2021, 2022, yes. correct. This is the same time where New York State received American Rescue Plan money. Yes. It's the same time where New York State received CARES Act money. Sure. It's the first time that New York State has been funded uh, by the uh, Campaign for Fiscal Equity, a lawsuit that they won 20 years ago that finally is going to be fully funded. So this 38K is the most money ever invested in New York State schools. Is that correct? Correct. That is correct. Okay. So prior to this influx of money, New York State was not spending 38000 per student. Do you know how correct, much they were spending? Correct, but still spending among the most, if not the most. Do you know how much? It was north of $30,000. North of 30000 yes. Okay. I don't have an exact figure. I can get it for okay, you. Okay, let's say 30000 for argument's sake. Let me explain student funding and student spending to those in the room who may not understand how it works. It is not 38000 for every single child in the school system. When you have a school system that has a disproportionate number of children with special needs and a disproportionate number of English language learners, the school system receives additional funding for those students. Is that correct, Dr. Burke? That is correct. That's correct. So because New York City has a disproportionate number of children with special needs and a disproportionate number of English language learners, New York City receives additional funding. So when I was a school principal, I had 250 students. If I had 38K per student, my budget would have been 8 million. It was never anywhere near that because I did not have a large number of children with special needs. In addition, this money is not per student in terms of we're giving students the money. This money is spent on teachers, staff, books, and different things like that. And if you are a child with special needs, or a child that's an English language learner, you need additional resources 
to make sure you are meeting your academic needs. Now, Dr. Burke, is it true that charter schools, by and large, take and receive less children with special needs than public schools? No, and in fact, if you look at not only charters, but private school choice programs, private school choice programs in particular, the fastest growing private school choice programs are for those kids with special needs. Are you familiar with Success Academy in yes. New York City? The Success Academy take the same percentage of special ed students that public schools take. I'd have to look. Okay. I don't know the percentages. They don't. Uh, I could tell you that. They do not. I can't tell you if they do or don't. I don't well, have I'm saying for the record, and anyone me. can look this up, Success Academy does not take the same percentage of children with special needs as New York City public schools. Um, I have a few other questions. Dr. M Mr. Messer, how are you doing? Do you support teachers' unions? Yes or no? I Teachers unions never supported me. Do you support teachers unions, yes or no? T teachers unions never supported me. Okay, so is that a no? Teachers yes or unions no, do never you support teachers me. unions? I don't have a yes or no answer to that. I'm sorry? I don't have a yes or no answer okay. to that. Okay, Dr. Burke, do you support teachers unions? No. No. Uh, Mr. Black, do you support teachers unions? I have no objection. I have no objection to them, but I don't donate any money to them. Yes or no? Uh, I support their mission, but I don't support them in any in individual capacity. Mr. Ms. Allen, do you support teachers' unions? No. No, you do not. Okay, so we have three of the four people who have identified themselves as people who do not support teachers' unions. It feels to me that this uh, support of voucher programs to move students out of public schools into private and or charter schools is a direct attack on the public school institution and infrastructure, and specifically on teachers' unions, as three of the four witnesses we have do not support teachers' unions. Let me ask another quick question, starting with Mr. Uh, Mr. Messer. Do you support the U.S. Department of Education, or do you think it should be dissolved? Um, when I was Dr. Burke, do you support the Department of Education, U.S.? No, it's dissolved. Okay. Uh, Ms. Allen, do you support the U.S. Department of Education? I worked at the U.S. Department of Education for two years. Saw. So, uh, yes, you do. I worked at the U.S. Department of Education so for no, two years. So, no, you don't. I worked yes there. or no. I worked do you support at the U.S. Department it or not? Of I'd rather not answer that. Okay. All right. Thank you. My time is up. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bowman. Let's go to Michigan, where Representative McLean is standing by. She's ready to go. Uh, Representative McLean, you are recognized. Thank you. Um, l let's just, out of curiosity, stay, stay with that same theme. Um, and I'd like an answer from all of you. Do you support students? Yes, Doctor, I you do, do support students. Wonderful. And I think it's um, crazy to say that supporting students somehow makes you anti-teachers union or Department of Education. I mean, the teacher, let, let's understand, and, and unions are great, right? Teachers unions are just that. They support the teachers. So I thought we were doing a hearing on students. So you support the students. Yes. How about you, do you support students? Yes, ma'am. Next. Yes, I do. Wonderful, how about you, ma'am? Of course. Okay, just so we're all clear, we're all here about the students, right? Because the goal today is about the student. Just checking. Okay. All right. In my home state of Michigan and across the country, families have suffered through prolonged school closings and lockdowns during the COVID-19 pandemic. That just it, it is what it is, right? Most students fell behind in math and reading. And we actually have data, facts, right, to support that. Um, and due to the forced remote instruction. I mean, I think the teachers did the best they could with the situation at hand. But Dr. Burke, can you talk more about how School of Choice actually helped families during the pandemic? Sure. Because I think what the pandemic showed too is people learn in different ways, right? We, we shouldn't go and we shouldn't just have this one size fits all. Because last I checked, we're here about the student, right? So do you think school of choice helped parents get their kids back in school sooner? Do you think in-person instruction would help these students close the learning gap created by the pandemic? Can you just talk about little, a little bit about that from the eyes of the most important, and that is the student? Yes, thank you, Congresswoman, for reorient, reorienting us to the student question uh, at hand today because it is all about students and we do not want students trapped in unaccountable public schools. 
Uh, but if we look at Catholic schools in particular during the pandemic, you're absolutely right. Private schools were much more likely to reopen much quicker than the district schools, largely because teachers unions kept those district schools closed. If we look at Catholic schools, they opened much quicker as soon as they knew it was safe to reopen, when the science showed that it was safe to reopen schools, and the result has been pretty phenomenal. There was a, a, a piece by Kathleen Porter McGee in the Wall Street Journal recently, and she found that if all Catholic schools, all 1.6 million children in Catholic schools were a state, they would outperform every other state on the NAEP in math and reading. Well, and so they gained, low-income kids in particular, uh, minority students in Catholic schools gained uh, 10 points in reading over the course of the pandemic when students across the country actually lost uh, three points in reading and eight points in math. I mean, this is a phenomenal story to tell about how Catholic schools thrived. Well, let, Dr. Burke, let's not let the facts get in the way of good story over here. So, <laughs> Mr. Messer, in your testimony, you mentioned the overwhelming support that School of Choice has among parents. In Michigan, we provide zero, no public support for parents to choose private educational options. The state is an increasingly out of step with the other states that do help parents access private schooling options. Policies that have a clear record a clear record of success again facts Can you talk more about what the polls tell us about support for school of choice across the country in my last minute remaining? Yeah, I mean overwhelmingly We live in an America today where we agree on almost nothing right? <laughs> But we all agree on school choice poll after poll 90% 80% 70% of Americans support school choice support here's three simple concepts one no child in america should be forced to go to a failing or unsafe school and every parent should be able to move their child if they're in if their kids in that kind of school 80 percent support across america it's not fair that only wealthy parents get to choose where their child goes to school 80 percent support all across america schools should focus on the basics not pushing a political agenda Parents should have a right to send their child to a different school if they think their school has gotten too political. 80% across America, including, by the way, 80% of African American parents who support that same point of view. If this was about what the American people want, we'd have universal school choice everywhere already. Imagine what we can do if we put the child first, we'd leave politics and, uh, at, at, uh, at the home. And uh, again, just really put the children first and we focus on facts and, and amazing what would happen if we had some accountability and some measurements. So with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Let's go to Connecticut where Representative Hayes is standing by for her five minutes. Representative Hayes, you are recognized. Thank you. Um, I am sitting here feverishly taking notes because I would like to recenter some of the comments that have been made in this committee. As an educator, I know for certain that predictable and sustained investments in our public schools do in fact lead to better student outcomes. And what we are talking about here today is decades of disinvestment. I agree that it is not fair that only wealthy parents should be able to decide where they send their schools. And I think the answer to that is to make all of our public schools the best that they can be. I also wanna say, just as a follow up to Representative Bowman's um, questions is that we are mandated. We have two very important mandates by um, the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act. Public schools have to take differently abled students, and we are mandated to address the needs of those students first. Two very important things stand out. We have to provide a free and appropriate education to kids with disabilities, and we have to do that side by side with their peers in the least restrictive environments. I will also say that this conversation about supporting students, supporting teachers, supporting teachers is supporting students. I hear over and over, I've heard that um, the, the COVID pandemic exposed what teachers were doing in the classroom as if teachers were hiding something. That um, teachers unions, um, the work that they've done, I remind you that teachers unions are teachers. And I can tell you that it was incredibly disturbing to hear one of the witnesses on the panel say that it took for you to go to a private school for a teacher to smile at you. Educated in public schools, taught in public schools, my children go to public schools, and I can tell you that those environments are warm and nurturing and could use additional federal funds. But this idea that the panacea for academic success is charter schools 
is completely deceiving. I will also note that there is a distinct difference between private charter schools and public charter schools. And I would encourage anyone who is listening to this committee to look those things up because a lot of the statistics that we're hearing today are from, in fact, public charter schools. I am a proponent of public charter schools. I think that parents should be able to choose a school that has a specific stream or a STEM academy or arts education or whatever it is their children are looking for. But I also believe that public funds should require public accountability. And that is what we're not talking about today. 90% of our children go to public schools and we should make sure that all of those schools, whether it's the school two towns away, the school across the street, or the school around the corner is the best school that it can be with the highest quality public education. My question today is for Professor Black. The Department of Education collects extensive data on public schools, including achievement, enrollment, discipline, bullying, and harassment, and special education information. This data collection helps make an informed decision on children's education. Unfortunately, in most states, private schools and private charter schools are not required to report the same information, even if they accept vouchers or public funding. Professor Is there any transparency or oversight built into school choice programs to ensure that the schools parents choose for their children are high quality, and is there any recourse if they are not found to be high quality? Additionally, do you believe states should, be, should fund voucher programs that do not meet high quality education standards? I do not believe they should fund vouchers that do not meet high quality education standards. There's tremendous lack of transparency in what happens outside of the public school system and therefore studies are often thinner because we don't have the data to which you reference. For the record, I would say I do support the public, uh, the U.S. Department of Education because it is the institution that ensures the enforcement of anti-discrimination statutes um, in this country. And I also would note for the record that no voucher program ever put to the people in the history of the United States of America has ever succeeded on the ballot. The most recent one of which I'm aware was in, in uh, Arizona and it failed 65 to 35 uh, percent in the state of Arizona. Thank you. As an educator by profession, I also support the U.S. Department of Education and their mission to ensure that every child in every zip code has a high quality public education. And in my last seconds, I just would like to amplify some of the challenges with charter schools that are not public. They vary by state. Um, there's a messy admission process that excludes many students. There's high teacher turnover and low student diversity. These are all things that we can look at and address if we truly want to make an argument for the charter school movement, and I am open to doing that. But I, um, quite frankly, I do not believe that that is the direction that this hearing is going. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Hayes, thank you very much. Uh, Representative Moran represents the great state of Texas, and he is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, from the great state of Florida. We appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Burke, I want to turn my attention to you and give you an opportunity to elaborate about some of the things that you mentioned in your uh, brief and in your opening statements. In particular, you mentioned about the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program. It's something Democrats have long criticized. Uh, that's especially unfortunate because, as you pointed out, the DCOSP has been remarkably successful. Uh, this program has helped rescue students from underperforming public schools and gives them better options. What can you say to my Democratic colleagues on the left who argue that this program should be terminated? Yeah. I mean, what a uh, travesty that would be for the thousands of children and their families who are currently enrolled. This, as I mentioned earlier, has been one of the great public policy success stories. and. DC is home to a pretty robust choice marketplace now. Over 40%, probably over 50% at this point, of students have access to public charter schools or enrolled in them. There's public school choice and then the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. And it has been a lifeline for children to attend safe and effective schools in the district. And you can see that play out. They show up at rallies where we see thousands of children who are rallying in order to keep this program secure. Um, during the Obama administration, near, nearly every budget cycle, President Obama tried to zero out funding for what is the nation's only federally supported school choice program. And these families showed up um, day after day to fight tooth and nail to secure this option. And so I genuinely hope that we can put it on more firm uh, footing moving forward. 
Right now, the OSP is really at the, at the whims of the federal appropriations process every year, and of course, that can get politicized. We need to move toward fu formula funding, the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program, so that it is a stable revenue source. We need to make it open to every single family in Washington, D.C. Every child should have access to a safe and effective school. And if I could just really quickly, we keep hearing that public schools are underfunded. Uh, and as uh, Mr. Messer alluded to a few minutes ago, they are still sitting on $100 billion of unspent ARP funding. I mean, there's more money than they can spend right now at the moment. We have to reorient toward funding families directly and moving away from funding these unaccountable systems of, of government schools to which we're assigning children. Thank you, and I, and I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate the, the concept of accountability. That's something that I think when we get into this discussion about teachers union gets lost because effectively the teachers unions resist accountability for performance in the classrooms, and that's unfortunate. If we could actually have true accountability, it might work out a whole lot better. Let's turn now to education uh, savings accounts, in particular for our military personnel. Yeah. We know that there's a lot of military personnel that get assigned to new bases, new locations, their families are then uh, effectively put in a geographic area where they do not have a public school choice, but they're forced into a certain uh, area. Talk about why education savings accounts, and particularly for military personnel, are so important. Thank you for that. And this is something that Congress should do <laughs> as soon as possible, in my opinion. I mean, the, the uh, national security is not only an enumerated power, but it is a responsibility of the federal government. And we know from survey after survey that about a third of military families have thought about leaving the service altogether because of the public school their child would have to attend at their next duty station. Military, kids of military families are assigned to the closest public school, to the duty station to which their parent is assigned when they move from state to state. We have to break that link, and we can do that by funding them directly through education savings accounts. A few military-connected children attend DOD schools. It's only actually about 4% of those children. The rest, 96%, attend public schools that are close to the duty station. And that has given a lot of heartburn to military families who need options when they are assigned to their next duty station in order to serve effectively. Thank you, Dr. Burke. And with uh, the minute that I have remaining, I, I just want to ask you about this notion that seems to be arising from, from uh, the other side about, well, if we're for school choice, somehow we're against public schools. Is, is that the way you see this uh, debate going? Is it really uh, that easy to say, well, if you're for school choice, you're against public schools? Uh, no, not at all. And look, if we look at state constitutions across the country, they do mandate for public education. We have to make a distinction between public education and public schooling. And yes, as I said earlier, publicly fund education, but allow families to choose what that looks like for them, what school works well for them, what school is safe and effective and aligns with their values. And we're getting to that point now. Uh, if we look across the country, we've got universal education choice now in six states, which is a really phenomenal development. That's right. And I'll just uh, conclude by saying that I personally have the option to send my kids anywhere I want to. I'm of, of, of the means where I could do that if I want to, but I choose to send them to a public school because for me and my family and my kids, that's the best choice. I want other parents to be able to make the choice that's best for their kids as well. Thank you for your testimony. I yield back. Thank you very much. Here's our uh, new order, Miller, Kylie, Scott, Fox, Good. So let's go to Illinois where Representative Miller is standing by and she is recognized for her five minutes of questions. Thank you. Mr. Mezzer, I have a question for you. In my home state of Illinois, very sadly, only 30% of students are reading at grade level and only 26% are proficient in math. How do you think school choice would better serve parents and students in Illinois? Yeah, look, I, I think that's a, a great question. And as was alluded to by Mr. Moran, um, there's a sort of false premise being thrown out there that we believe that somehow there is some panacea. Here is, I think, the panacea, empowering parents through education freedom. And if you have a child who's unable to be in academic standards, you can find um, a school that fits their needs better. Through programs like the ECCA, um, the tax credit scholarship bill that Congressman Owens, Smith, Walorski, and others have supported, uh, you, you have the option to pay for tutoring, to um, take a, a, you know, a, a math tutoring course mm -hmm. if you need to. I, I think that the key that we have to remember is it's not enough 
to just tell folks, well, tough. And the reality is, and I'm, I'm going to say it, we got a lot of folks in America who can afford to have choice and send their kids wherever they want who are ready to fight to make sure others don't. Yes, and I grieve as long, along with many of the other members at the thought that we have disabled our young people by not giving them the proper education. And definitely parents should have the power to make the educational decisions which are best for their children, including moving them out of failing schools and into schools where they can succeed. So thank you so much. And I want to yield my remaining time to Congressman Owens. Thank Congress. you, Snow, and you're recognized Thank for you the so remaining much. time. Um, I'd like to, um, first of all, just make, make a point that, that you're right, the panacea is that when a mom and dad looks at their child, it's all said and done, and said, I did my best and I succeeded. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have millions of children today and millions of parents who do not feel that way. They think they're failures, they think uh, that the system is not for them, and we've seen results of that as we speak. Um, I just, uh, with the, um, with the, um, the Educational Choice for uh, the Children's Act, uh, help, me on, help us understand also the, the, uh, um, the scholarship organizations, how that works out, and, and is that something that comes out of the federal, uh, federal budget, or just help, help, help us understand that piece of it. Well, you have 21 states in America today that have educational SGOs, scholarship granting organizations. Um, the reality is that means that you also have 29 who don't. So, in the, so the scholarship organizations will operate differently in the states where they already exist, then they just build on top of that. And the reality is, is many of the scholarships that are available for families today don't get them all the way to where they need to be to have an actual choice. But an important part of the ECCA is it will allow for there to be scholarships in states that don't currently have any other choice option. And frankly, states where the teachers union has such a um, political entrenchment that those options probably won't come to those states for quite some time. Illinois, an example of, of a state that is uh, like that. How does the ECCA do that? Simply through freedom. It allows a donor to write a charitable tax contribution to a scholarship granting organization that then will be able to decide, you know, and give parents opportunities. And that donor gets a tax credit and the understanding that they are finally building our country back with good education by educating those kids that don't have it, do not have it. Let me just ask you, how many, how many children do you have? Uh, I have three. Three? One. One. Two. Okay. Um, would you agree that you know best for your child? Uh, than we do here, uh, this, uh, sitting up here right now? Yeah. That's, really, that's, really the, that's the conversation, my friends. You do, and so does every other parent out there. And, our, and these parents love their children like we love our children. So it's time for us to start putting down parents. It's, to, it's not time for us to stop acting that they don't know what they're doing. They can't sit down and think this process through what's best for their child. If a, if a system is not working with the public, private, parochial, homeschool, if it's not working, they will do their best to make sure to get to a, a place that does work. So thank you for your participation. Thank you for your passion. And uh, Ms. Allen, I can't say enough. Thank you for your success. That's what we need to see more of. Thank you so much. Now you're back. Thank you very much. Let's go to California. Representative Kylie is standing by. Representative Kylie, you're recognized. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Starting uh, first with just a, a, pr a brief point of clarification, uh, we heard a lot of references on the other side to private charter schools. Uh, Mr. Messer, are charter schools public or private schools? They're public schools. And we also heard the other side say that somehow charters get to pick and choose their students. Is that true? No. What are charter schools required to do when it comes to admission in most cases? There may be others on the panel that can answer better than me, but uh, essentially a public school is required to meet the standards of public schools. And accept all students. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Black, um, you're an opponent of school choice, correct? Not in all forms, but at least in the form of, that we've been discussing thus far, yes. But private choice can, or I should say school choice, as mentioned earlier in the form of magnets, uh, is tremendously successful. And charters with appropriate restrictions could also produce uh, positive benefits that okay. I would support. So I wouldn't say I am all for sure, all but you oppose choice. the use of public funds for private education, private schools. Um, if there are, in most instances, I, I wouldn't say there are no instances in which I would say it was appropriate. Oh, and when, where would you support that? 
Um, you know, there are students who need residential housing um, situations because of severe physical and mental disabilities that simply cannot be delivered okay. in a regular public education setting, and that seems to me. But to by be and large, you're opposed to the use of. Public by and funding. large, I would think that it. Uh, by and large, the state constitutions are opposed to it, and I stand sure. in accordance. But you don't with think that. private schools should be abolished or anything like that? No, I do not. So you do support the right of families to send their kids to private school if they can afford it? I support yes. And so the likes of, uh, you know, uh, President Biden, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom, Nancy Pelosi, Elizabeth Warren, who have paid large sums of money to send their kids to private school, you support their right to do that? I support an individual's choice to spend their money in whatever way they choose to, so long as it doesn't violate state or federal law. And so uh, you make an interesting argument in your testimony. You say that, uh, that the U.S. Constitution, uh, Article 4, Section 4, uh, says that Congress must guarantee a Republican form of government in the states. And you go on to say that since the nation's founding, the provision of public education has been understood as a central pillar of democracy and a Republican form of government. Uh, Professor Black, did COVID-era school shutdowns violate the Republican government clause of the United States Constitution? Did, could you repeat your did statement? Did COVID-era school shutdowns violate the Republican government clause of the U.S. Constitution? Public schools continue to provide education, so when you say shut down, what, in what respect do well, you Well, for shut example, uh, the Burbio in-person instruction tracker for the 2021 school year uh, has an index of in-person instruction. Now, the vast majority uh, of states were above 50%, uh, but the five lowest states below 25% or Hawaii, Washington, Maryland, Oregon, and last of all, my uh, home state of California. Uh, would you say that those states violated the Republican government clause of the U.S. Constitution uh, by refusing to offer an in-person instruction to their students when other states were able to do so? I would not say, I would, the premise of the question as I understand it, and maybe I misunderstand it, is that they must provide public education at a particular time, in a particular day, in a particular method. The Republican form of government does require public education, but it does not specify the time of day or the location of which that could occur, and thus times in which one was not in school can be made up at later points. So I think you ask a very complicated question that I'd be happy to have further discussions about, but I think there's a lot of nuances to Do the Do you think premises. it was a mistake for those uh, states to keep their schools closed that long? You keep saying closed. Uh, or failing to offer in-person instruction. I'm not a scientist. I don't think I'm prepared to say at what point we should have had in-person instruction or not. I was ultimately think we would follow the CDC guidelines. Okay. You also note that Florida has received an F when it comes to uh, spending rankings, uh, and uh, I and you then go on to note that some schools, uh, some that several other states received A and B ratings. I looked up one of those uh, at random, Washington, D.C., which received an A rating, and then compared how those uh, two jurisdictions, Florida and D.C., have done when it comes to education outcomes and the National Assessment of Education Progress for students eligible for free or reduced lunch. For fourth grade uh, reading, uh, Florida 61% achieved basic, basic level of achievement, uh, and D.C. was 38%. Eighth grade reading, uh, it was 62%. Uh, to 49 percent. Uh, so why is it that you care more about the level of the amount of money that is being spent uh, than the amount that students are learning? I do not care more about the amount that's spent. I, I care about studies that show the amount spent correlates and as to this comparison you make, the percentage of students with disabilities uh, low income in the District of Columbia is exponentially greater than it is in the state of Florida. And if I might just add that I did a comparison of students who are eligible for free or reduced lunch. This is an apples oh, to absolutely. apples comparison. My apologies. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Colley, and uh, well done to keep it in the time. Uh, he represents the great Commonwealth of Virginia. He's also the ranking member of the full education and workforce, and I'm uh, happy to recognize him uh, for his five minutes. Uh, Representative Scott, you're recognized. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor Black, are there public and private charter schools? There are, all public, all charter schools are public, but some of them are run by private entities as opposed to public or nonprofit entities. So the distinction would be those that are run by nonprofits versus those that are run by private entities. Okay, um, one of the criticisms about vouchers is that if you start a voucher program, the first thing you do is fund those already in private schools. Um, is that right? A very substantial portion of those uh, programs do fund children who are already in private schools. Um, and if you 
Does, do the vouchers cover the tuition of the private school? It does not cover the tuition of many private schools and thus children who can't make up the difference or um, cannot afford to go to all private schools. So that if you, don't, if you can't afford the difference, then it, you don't get any help. You mentioned um, disinvestment. Is that because the political pressure when you have vouchers and public school system, the, public pr the political pressure is to increase the vouchers and not so much increase the investment in public schools? You certainly know politics far better than I, a Representative, but I would say that it is my experience that vouchers are very popular in part inside of state legislative buildings, but not very popular at all outside of them. Um, and uh, do the private schools get to select who their students are based on academics, um, better behavior, or parental involvement? Yes. Um, on evidence of success, Dr. Burke mentioned um, the success of the D.C. schools I think, in terms of academic success. Uh, I think you mentioned that when you equate for parental involvement, um, education level of parents, other demographics, can you say what happens to the achievement level um, after, you've, after you've done that? Uh, my reading of those studies is that the achievement levels are not higher in the private schools. Uh, say, say again? My reading is that those studies, when we account for the things that you mentioned, do not demonstrate higher achievement in, in D.C.'s private schools okay. for students participating in those programs. In civil rights, um, you're talking about civil rights laws, uh, one of the problems we're experiencing today is increased segregation in public schools. Um, Green versus New Kent County, um, Virginia is from my home state uh, that found freedom of choice unconstitutional. Can you say what these school choice programs do to the um, integration or segregation of our public schools? They do not contribute to it, and my understanding, based upon what I'm looking at, is they are perpetuating or at least facilitating additional uh, various forms of additional segregation and stratification in private schools, yeah. as opposed to public schools. Um, in terms of discipline, if the private school expels problem students or doesn't accept private um, students, uh, what happens to those students? They could raise a contract breach, but the United States Constitution does not apply to them. So they would end up back at the public school system? Yes. Um, are private schools covered by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act? No. So what happens to all the students that need those services? Uh, they, would, they wouldn't get them. They wouldn't be legally entitled to them in a private setting. Um, now, we've talked about students who are stuck in a failing school, and they need choice. It seems to me the rational choice was everyone would get up and leave. Um, the fact is that whatever choice system you have, 90% of them are going to be left behind with less resources, less political pressure. How is it a good idea to leave those 90% behind? How are they helped with a choice program? They are not, as one study of Chicago schools aptly put it, the real privilege in America is not having to make a choice as to where to go to school. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are you back? <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Scott. Uh, let's go to the chair. How about this? She's the chair of the full committee. I was honored when she is uh, on our subcommittee. She's also a former educator. She is from the great state of North Carolina, and she is recognized now. Uh, Dr. Fox, uh, you are recognized for question and answer period. Thank you, Chair Chairman Bean. I think you've uh, held an excellent uh, hearing today, and I appreciate that. Um, Congressman Messer, uh, it was a pleasure to serve with you, and it's a pleasure to see you in the role that you're in right now, uh, working on such a great cause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you obviously have extensive experience on the issue of school choice uh, at all levels. I've long believed that education is best handled at the state and local level and not the federal government. 
one of the best ways to empower parents rather than the DC bureaucrats is to put educational choices back in the hands of parents. Um, you've served as president of School Choice Indiana, consistently advocated for school choice during your time in the Indiana State House. What principles do you think DC policymakers should keep in mind when it comes to education and what can state and local leaders do to keep the federal government from micromanaging schools? Well, I think I've got a kind of a high-minded answer and then a really practical answer. Okay? So the high-minded answer is to remember the stakes, and we talk a lot in this building about the Constitution, appropriately so. I don't think we talk enough about the second, the second paragraph of the Declaration, which says we're all endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, rights that can't be taken from you, the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You can't do that in America today. You can't pursue happiness if you don't have access to a quality education. We need to make sure every family has that choice. How do you do it? That's the practical part. This isn't complicated. Empower parents. Parents know best. It, it can't both be true that our current public school system is doing a fabulous job and be true that if we give parents an option, everybody's going to pour out of the school and somehow destroy them, right? The reality is, is the, and, and we're now 30 years into this debate, parents leave when it's best for their child to leave, and the rest of the system improves. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Allen, I was quite moved by uh, reading your personal story and hearing it today. Your story perfectly encapsulates why we need school choice. I'm overjoyed that Florida's tax credit scholarship was available to you and had such a positive impact. What troubles me is that many children in our country don't have that opportunity. Republicans are absolutely committed to making sure every child has the opportunity you had to fun, find the educational option that works best for them and their families. Uh, I know you're the first in your family to graduate from high school, college, and graduate school, which is a remarkable accomplishment. Can you talk about what it means to you and your family to be the first in your family to achieve such a high level of education? It's, uh, it's a tremendous success. It's a pleasure for me to serve as this trailblazer. Um, in my family, uh, my niece is now also a college graduate. Uh, she's a nurse traveling across the country. Um, and it's a pleasure that she looks up to me. And so we've been able to set a new trajectory and it's because of education freedom. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Burke, one of the arguments we've already heard from our Democrat colleagues is a school choice hurts traditional public schools. And I think uh, Congressman Messer explained it very well just now. If the public schools are doing such a great job, then why do we are afraid of choice and the fact that people will leave? But it's not true, and we know it's not true. We also know that competition creates an incentive for anybody to improve and breaks up the monopoly power of traditional public school districts. That's what it would do. I believe in school choice not only because it helps students at private schools and charter schools, but because it helps traditional schools. I know you've spent your career analyzing the evidence on school choice. Could you give us quickly some findings from the research on how school choice affects traditional public schools? Thank you, Chairwoman Fox, I appreciate that. So you're right, it's a competitive pressure that creates that rising tide that lifts all boats. We know that school choice improves academic outcomes for children who choose to stay in their district schools as well. There are 28 empirical evaluations of the effect of school choice and the competitive pressure that it puts on public schools as well. These are matching and longitudinal studies. Of those 28, 26 show positive effects for students in public schools as more and more private schools begin to participate in a school choice program. One finds a null effect and only one found a negative effect. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you very much, Dr. Fox. Uh, our final member in the spotlight just entered the building and uh, or in our entered our room, and he is from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Let's go to Virginia, where Mr. Good is standing by for his five minutes, and he is recognized. Thank you, Chairman Bean, and thank you to our witnesses. I think I'm the only thing standing between you and being paroled from this hearing today. But thanks for your time today. Uh, first, just a question or two to Ms. Allen. Appreciate, again, you being with us today. 
our backgrounds are somewhat similar, where I grew up in a lower income family, grew up on food stamps, free school lunch, and I'm old enough, it was the days when not everyone had free school lunch, you had to qualify for it, and uh, went, into, went to rough inner city schools, uh, low income uh, white kids, low income minority kids, rough background, rough schools, but through the benevolence of others, my family could never afford it. I was able to go to a private Christian school for high school, which made a tremendous impact on my life, similar to what I've seen in your testimony on, on the impact that it made for you. Um, as you know, Title I of the uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act was created to help, in theoretically in any way, disadvantaged students. Uh, in a community like where you grew up in Eastside Jacksonville, how would you comment on uh, the effectiveness of the federal funds being, uh, how, what kind of an impact are they being made, are they effectively being leveraged, I should say, to help disadvantaged students in your experience? Of course. The Every school that I want, went to um, in elementary school was a Title I school and did not meet my needs. The schools are currently still Title I and currently still poor, poor performing and lower income. With my work um, at the American Federation for Children, I started a special project called Black Minds Matter. Mm -hmm. And I actually have the first and the only directory of black school founders. And these are folks who started schools. Um, and many of these black school founders used to be public school teachers in Title I schools. And what's interesting is that they reached a ceiling and they saw that they couldn't help, they couldn't do as much as they wanted to really help kids learn. So they decided to start their own school. Many of the colleagues and members were talking about teachers in the, in the public schools and in the system. S teachers who are teaching in private and charter schools are doing a tremendous job at trying to help give students more opportunity. And so they're also benefiting from what we're talking about today. You know, uh, certainly you see the imp the other side, what they, th you know, we talk about school choice a lot on our side, if you will, and I hate to say sides like that. The other side is very much against school choice and will say, you know, that school choice harms the public schools. Their feeling is if a public school is toxic, if it's failing, if it's dangerous, if it's not meeting the needs of the children or the families uh, that are uh, subjected to those schools, then everyone should have to share in that misery and no one should have the opportunity for school choice. Uh, I have a bill, it's called the Choice Act, which would allow federal dollars allocated for education to follow the child to the uh, school choice of the family, whether it was another public school, you know, some districts charge you to go outside your district, of course, a few thousand dollars in Virginia in some cases, uh, whether it was the private or Christian school or homeschool expenses or what have you, uh, how might it have made a difference or would it, for people like uh, others in your situation, yourself maybe, if federal dollars went to the school choice of the family instead of being restricted to uh, that public school where the, the child happens to reside. It would make a tremendous difference. You know, uh, folks who have uh, backgrounds similar to ours are wanting better options for their students. Um, there's a very sad story of a mom from Ohio who tried to pick a different public school for her um, daughter and ended up in jail because she was violating the law by sending her kid to a school outside of her district assigned zip code. And that's not, that's not a free equitable system. Um, we need one though. Yeah, I, and sadly, unfortunately, there is not a correlation that we can demonstrate terms of achievement or excellence in education and the dollars allocated per school district. Some of the areas across the country where we spend the most money in the public school system or government school system, uh, we get the worst outcomes in those systems. Uh, this for Dr. Burke, and again, thank you for being with us and with the limited time that I have left. Could you just comment on uh, how you feel like the effectiveness uh, is demonstrated by the federal government's role in education? What's the proper role of that education and what's the demonstrated effectiveness for the mandates and the controls that come with the federal government's min a small amount of dollars that are allocated? Well, education is not an enumerated power of the federal government. So the more that we can do to start winding down federal intervention in K-12 mm -hmm. education, the better. Uh, the track record has been incredibly poor, unfortunately, since Lyndon Johnson launched his war on poverty. We've spent two trillion just at the federal level alone, which remember is just 8.5% of all K-12 education funding. And outcomes, if you look at the NAEP long-term trend assessment, are flat for reading and math achievement over time. We're still in the middle of the pack internationally. 
uh, disadvantaged students are still struggling with graduation rates, et cetera. So we've got to change that dynamic, start winding down federal spending and intervention in K-12 education, and allow education choice to flourish in the states. Thank you. In Virginia, 94% of our funding for the schools comes from state and local, and I would submit that the 6% we get from the feds is not, not worth it. it. We can make do on the 94% without the federal mandates and the negatives that come with it. Thank you so much. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Good. At the beginning of our program today, I promised uh, that there would be interesting debate, robust concepts, and uh, big thoughts and ideas. And thanks to each of our panelists today, uh, that was a promise fulfilled. Y'all all did a great job, and uh, thanks for the time this morning. Before we adjourn, uh, Ranking Member Bonamici and I discussed the need to review our audio system, and uh, maybe we can improve it going forward, or at least review it, but uh, what a great day. So to all the members, thanks for doing your homework coming in before and coming in prepared. Uh, let's go have a great day. Since there's no business uh, before the committee, we stand adjourned. <laughs>